When MH370 vanished eight years ago with 239 people on board, nobody back then could have imagined we'd still be searching for it today. It's unthinkable to think that an aircraft this size could vanish in this day and age with our communications that we have. It baffled aviation wizards across the world, including former Qantas pilot Richard de Krepny, who initially had high hopes it would be found. I was as shocked as every other pilot because we understand the communications that exist between the aircraft and the manufacturer of the aircraft and air traffic control. So it was pretty remarkable that an aircraft could disappear. So were you thinking that surely this would be able, we'll be able to find this plane given there are so many modes of communication? Oh, I'm confident we'll find the aircraft. I'm absolutely 100% confident we'll find the aircraft. It might take 100 years. It might be like trying to find the old gold ships from, from the 1800s, but we will find it. Richard knows exactly what happens when things go wrong piloting large passenger jets. Back in 2010, he safely landed QF-32, saving the lives of 469 people on board after the plane suffered a catastrophic engine failure as it was leaving Singapore. But in the case of MH370, the evidence points to the plane's pilot, Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah, being responsible for its disappearance after all aircraft communication with the outside world was shut off. The theory is he was on a suicide mission. But Richard is cautious about any speculation. Why do you think we lost communication with that? I don't know. Maybe it was a hijack. Maybe there was a fire. Maybe a passenger took the aeroplane. Maybe um, a pilots did something. I don't know. And there's no information. They could have intentionally turned it off. It could have been aircraft damage. The six out of seven radios ended up failing on QF32. So we couldn't talk to the firemen initially. But if you're lacking the data, you're missing the first point. So a hypothesis without data is just a dream. Apart from satellite data that intermittently tracked the aircraft as it flew into the Southern Indian Ocean, as well as a few pieces of wreckage that have washed up, there are very few solid facts about the plane's final resting place. Fact number one, it's in the Indian Ocean. Fact number two, the flotsam surfacing at Madagascar would suggest that the aircraft is somewhere in the Indian Ocean. Now, that the, they're the only facts that I have. Out on the Indian Ocean, it's pretty lonely. It's very lonely. There's often no one within a thousand miles of you. Uh, there's no, you won't hear anyone on the radio. So you've got all these From the cockpit of a retired 747, Richard contemplates the isolation of flying a plane over the deserted Southern Ocean. There aren't many aircraft flying over the Indian Ocean. You're in the sky by yourself, so you feel quite alone. There's really nothing to see other than really high swells, 100 feet swells. Um, lots of white caps, it's windy, it's a pretty nasty place. You could be five hours from the nearest airport if something goes wrong. If you go down into that ocean, we all thought about it and we all said we, no one would survive ditching into the Southern Ocean. What would you do if something went wrong over the Indian Ocean? It depends what the nature of the problem is. Um, if it's a sick passenger, then we might need to divert. We might take them to this destination. If we're out of fuel, we might change our track and go to an another airfield to pick up fuel. If the aircraft was on fire and maybe the wing is going to burn off, we would ditch it in the water. So that is a real possibility to ditch in the water if something goes wrong? Absolutely. You know better than most what it's like to be in a cockpit when things go wrong. What goes through your head? Pilots are trained to be what we call bulletproof and not gun shy. So we're trained in all the things that go wrong. Uh, unprecedented is not an excuse to be unprepared. You see, we can't predict the future, we can't control it, but we can be prepared. What do you think happened to MH370? Well, I'm very confident that the aircraft took off and it arrived at the boundary between Malaysia and Southeast Asia and then it vanished 
and the data suggests that it's somewhere in the Indian Ocean, those two sources, uh, and hopefully a third source to come in. That's what I know, and I'm very comfortable and confident to work with that data to structure how to find the aircraft. Do you think we will find Absolutely. MH370? Absolutely. It might take, it might, it could take 100 years, it could take 200 years. When we do find it, we'll get the data recorder. The data recorder is certified to take 35,000 G. It can go to the deepest ocean in the world. It will stay together indefinitely. When that aircraft is found, we will get the solution will be solved. We will have MH370 will be sold. The only variable is how long it takes. The families would say it's already taken long enough. It's taken too long. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.